Welcome to the Dash Arts Podcast, Seeing the World Through an Artistic Lens. I'm Josephine Burton. And I'm Rachel Hedge. Um, lovely to be back here with you. It's so nice. And we're sitting in the Dash office, which is and amazing. This is the first time we've ever recorded the Dash Arts Podcast together yeah. and in the Dash offices. Yeah, it's radical. Which <laughs> feels wild. Um, and we're here you know, in the middle of the first day of rehearsals, recording this as well in your lunch break. In the last episode, we kicked off the series by discussing epic poems and the oral tradition of storytelling. And this time we're focusing more on contemporary retellings of myth. So for centuries, myths have been immortalising the actions of men whilst repeatedly marginalising female narratives. Um, Even modern translations celebrate men as heroes whilst women and non-binary characters are ignored or villainised However, representation in mythology is finally changing, and in recent years there's been a huge increase in the number of myths being retold, which give back agency and narrative to women and non-binary people. And that work is what I wanted to focus on in this episode. And we could hardly do that without discussing Dido's bar. So as we just said, rehearsals kicked off. It's already this amazing, inclusive cast who are being so thoughtful in their roles. Um, We'll hear from Lola later, who's playing Dido herself. But I wanted to ask you, Josephine, why did you call the show Dido's Bar rather than the Aeneid or any other name around Aeneas's journey or... You know, there's so many things that it could have been, but it's Dido's bar. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think um, there's a couple of lovely tributes that I could play or pay or whatever the expression is to people along the way. Um, I remember um, when I was trying to find a way to tell Maruv's story, his extraordinary story of being a refugee himself, um, I, and I stumbled upon the Aeneid. I remember uh, coming across um, something that Natalie Haynes, that, who, is, who, is, who herself has done extraordinary work and um, retelling the stories, classical stories from a woman, a female perspective. And um, I remember her saying, yeah, it's just, it's the story of our time that you need, the story of a refugee from the East. And she's so right. And that's really why this works so well. But actually what I adore about the story of the Aeneid is that it's not just one refugee story. It's not like one person's narrative amongst a whole bunch of Westerners. There are two extraordinary, quite different Mm -hmm. stories of the experience of migration in the tale. Then there's Aeneas who comes from war-torn Troy and then there's Dido who escapes a, like, really effectively domestic violence um, in her her family. And um, I felt like... I really wanted to find a way of referencing that, that it doesn't just become a one person story. The two two people's quite different narratives make it more complicated and more, more add more layers to the, the tale and make it more universal. So I guess, um, although it's Aeneas' story, and although Maruf in a way is Aeneas, uh, bringing in Dido and referencing Dido kind of um, widens the perspective on the show. That's sort of one answer. And then the other answer is that it's been a long time in the making and um, Dido's bar and a very early R&D that Aeneas and I did and yes you see I've done it already <laughs> Maruf, not Aeneas um the inspiration Amazing. for the inspiration for Aeneas Maruf um, Maruf and I did in in Scotland uh like nearly two and a half years ago we it was Maruf and I and Amar Hajj Ahmed who himself is a brilliant actor and a refugee from Syria um and the the playwright Chino Adimba um were in Scotland and we were playing a lot with how to watch the story we we read a lot of the Aeneid together Aeneas and we've definitely talked about that Maruf and I reading and reading and reading the story together and over and over but we started also to think about like what's the world what world are we telling and I just remember the four of us just grappling with who is it where does it open where's where's the place the world in which our show happens and Dido's Bar kind of came out of that very long that conversation about the kind of finding a contemporary way of telling the story so it was it was in that special time up in Scotland in Cove Park that the name emerged then it latched onto the show it became very clear and of course like I guess Purcell the the Purcell opera of Dido and Nias that she Purcell latched on Dido as the as the kind of fundamental protagonist through his opera so she's very attractive as a character and it's great like, like there's such kind of tragedy in her own personal story um, that um, that there's another that's like you know, it's a lovely thing to to be doing with our show how do you think that's changed the the retelling but that decision of calling it Dido's bar it will never now just be Aeneas's story people won't ever just think about Aeneas people will think of Dido first yeah. and then and then Aeneas has that changed the story for you guys have you had to keep thinking about her role and rethinking about her role yeah, I think what it does is that it makes it 
it, you know, it, it, you're, you're so right. It gives it gives us it gives access to other voices. And Dido is just an enormously sympathetic character. You know, we we don't really we don't really love Aeneas fully in the original story. We won't fully love him in our show either. Dido, we just feel for we fall in love with her at the beginning of the show, and then we feel for her enormously as she has her tragedy. And so, you know, she's the sort of she's the soul at the heart of the show in a way. So I'm really happy that we get to pay tribute to her and her story. Yeah. Um, and Dido is not the only female story that you've put forefront. You added. Sorry, I just kicked you. I just kicked her for the listeners. It's quite nice. <laughs> it's like it's like the great opportunity for us to be in the same room, being kicked. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you've added a new female character to the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We totally have. Um, this is a kind of an ongoing conversation that I, I've had with Hattie, and our wonderful, our wonderful writer, uh, about about the show because. The other thing I was going to say earlier, really, is it's a weird one, the original Aeneid poem, because the great love story is the story between Dido and Aeneas. Mm. It's a 12-book epic poem. Dido's dead by the end of book four. And that, sh- that is the love story at the heart of the show. And, and then kind of Aeneas cracks on and he gets to Italy and he sort of has a relationship and he sort of marries the girl. And, and then they live happily ever after and the girl gives him the keys to the kingdom. But that girl, Lavinia, she doesn't say a word mm. through the whole of the show. I mean, she's totally voiceless and we're really uncomfortable with having a voiceless her like romantic lead uh, seemed completely problematic in so many ways and so um there is a, a really interesting female character in the second half of the story, which is Amata, who is uh, Lavinia's mum. And in the original poem, Amata has this kind of great, like, as a, like a Latin name, in Latin it's kind of loved or loving or something. So she's really like passionate and she's set totally on a flame by um, Juno um, and she stirs up enormous amounts of trouble and she's the, sort of one of the causes of, of the, the problems that Aeneas faces when he arrives in Italy. But she's sort of not the love interest and although we tried to weave in there's definitely been like we've definitely had uh, moments Hattie and I of saying well maybe the mother is is the like the love interest for ter- for, mm. for Aeneas that just felt like it wasn't going to quite work so uh, we ended up deciding that we were going to create a, no- a new role for our show which is a combination of the kind of passion and the the, the kind of voice of a martyr and the, the the love interest of Lavinia so she's sort of a mixture of Lavinia Amata Martina we kind of got there merging the two of names together and Martina has a really important role to play in our show and we've given her quite a strong powerful voice and we really explored that quite heavily in in when we, we had an R&D in Cornwall in, in the summer and we explored how to give her that voice and what is that voice because she has she start well I don't want to give too much away but she plays an important role in the show and that's been kind of lovely to, to create a character that's just sort of already there uh, but give her more meat and more interest and more more agency. It kind of feels that the four female characters, they all give strong main character energy. You know, Didus, Juno, Venus, Martina. You're so right. I mean, it's a, it's a non as an ensemble, we are we are gender balanced because the the wonderful house band, the Underworlds, um, are all male, and but of the six actor musicians there mm. are like four of them are women. So we've got you know the cast are quite female heavy yeah. and. Juno and Venus you're so right to bring that up Rachel like they're also two women that we have given even more power to because in the original story from the poem Juno and Venus were like you know warring goddesses that hate each other that are trying to like manoeuvre themselves to be the powerful one and to kind of outplay the other one but there's Jupiter in the middle of it and Jupiter is ultimately the king and he's the one that basically tells his wife Juno in the end like you just give up just give up you're not going to win anything just let Aeneas you know let Aeneas get the keys to the kingdom and Juno has to sort of back off and say okay fine husband all right but just give me one little thing and I can't even what it is but (laughs) there's one concession that Jupiter gives to Juno in that but she ultimately is powerless to stop what happens to fate and Aeneas we've we've written out Jupiter of our story so Juno and Venus are all powerful there's no one like disrupting their power and they are puppet masters for the rest of the cast so they are in control so you're you're right we have absolutely kind of peopled our show with strong powerful female characters yeah who all have agency and and incredible songs and i'm about to to speak to lola may we're also being played out by priscilla grace singing what is so far my favorite song (laughs) it's fair to say um so got all of that to look forward to and just before you go remind us of the the dates yes yeah so we open on the friday the 23rd of september 
and um, we are in uh, the wonderful and phenomenally exciting factory, which is a um, like a warehouse as part of it, just part of the Tate and Lyle Sugar Factory, and um, out in the Royal Docks in Newham, and we're there until the 15th of October and we're also in Manchester and we're in Leicester and we're in Portsmouth and we're in Oxford so we are on the road and making the work and singing the songs and causing mischief until the 29th of October. As I mentioned, Lola May is our amazing Dido, and I caught her for a quick chat in the middle of rehearsals. Also throughout this episode, I'll be playing in music from Dido's bar that I managed to grab from the rehearsal room as a little sneak peek. Enjoy! I'm playing Dido, playing Dido's bar, and, um... The yeah. chiller role. Yeah, yeah. She, she's, she's a fierce woman. She really is, and thinking about, you know, why it's called Dido's Bar. She haunts the story throughout, mm. you know, when she's not there physically. Her essence and who she was haunts the piece throughout to the end. <laughs> Sad and beautiful. I mean, yeah. she really does. And it's and she's had so many iterations, you know, through the years of, of working on Dido's Bar mm. and so many R&Ds where we've been trying to find the right journey for her mm. um and i think you now we found it but obviously you've just joined the project mm -hmm. so what what was it that attracted you to the role um so i got uh the brief um through my agent and my agent was like i'm interested interested in you know having me i was like yes please <laughs> and I me what sounds like. so we had a chat um about who I thought Dido was, and I was just like, she's a strong woman. But Aeneas obviously touches something in her that makes her vulnerable, mm. um, which is not her weakness per se, but she wants love again, and she sees that in him. I guess before him, she'd, you know, kind of survived. She'd left her land and... You know, she had this, she was, she was channeled, she, she uses music to channel what she can't speak about, mm. um, which is why people keep coming back to the bar. Um, and so I, you know, I just, I was drawn to that and I was drawn to her vulnerability with him and also her wanting to fight because she puts herself in danger just to keep her love. Um, but she's, she's a fighter, which is... You know, like a lot of women today, you, you fight for the right to have your voice heard. You you fight to tell your story. So, yeah, I thought that was a character is very beautifully written. Um, and the songs are beautiful. Mm. The songs are very beautiful. Dida is this incredibly moving, beautiful singer mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in yourself. <laughs> Um, so I've, that's, a, that's a lot of pressure I've just put on you. No, it's, it's going to be perfect. Um, is there something about it as well that she she's a woman and we're giving a lot of space to that narrative in, in our production? But, you know, Aeneas is an immigrant and trying to find his place. Mm -hmm. Dido is also a refugee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me it feels really important because we're not giving all of the complex social political narrative to to Aeneas. It's also an issue that Dido has to grapple with and is living with, mm -hmm. and you know, not the entire story for her doesn't revolve around just wanting to be with Aeneas. She's got so much other stuff that she's having to cope with. That's true. Although she, she sort of lets her guard down with him, she, he's not privy to all her, all the issues going on in, in her life. Mm. And I, I wondered why. There's something about having your own voice and if you're vulnerable or if you put yourself in a situation where you're, where you're vulnerable, it almost feels like you lose control and you're having to fight for that voice back. A lot of what you were saying about, um, you know, projects that are looking at women's stories you know, we make decisions based on so many things. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the way she con continues to want the peace. So even though their lives go different ways, she still wants 
you know, and Juno still talks about her, Venus talks about her, mm. and they're still, you know, almost is reminded about her in um, in things that go on. So I think I think that's beautiful. Um, I mean, we go back to your point about women being, you know, refugee women and, and so on. It's You carry a lot. You carry a lot that you can't articulate, but influences everything you do, regardless of whether you think about it or not you know, answers you give or what, whatever is in your subconscious, like you, ca- you carry that trauma with you and, and it is trauma. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when a woman feels she has no power and then to sort of claim power in whatever way she can, yeah. whatever form that might be. But those stories are prevalent everywhere in the world. So. And like, just for you personally, why do you think that we are seeing so many of these stories now being told and, and trying to find ways to to update the narrative a little bit or even give back. It's not that these stories never existed. They always existed. But we've, we've you know, well, we live in a patriarchy yeah. Where, yeah. where men get to tell the stories. And, yeah. and now we are trying to expand that narrative again and Absolutely. give back power. Like, why do you think we're seeing so much of that now? Not to refer to the pandemic, but, I mean, the pandemic mm. was... It was amazing in certain ways because it basically hit us that we're bored. We're bored of the same old things. We're bored of the same old stories that tell the same old things and the man saves the day. Nothing against (laughs) men, but it's like, come on, you know, it takes two. The way I see it is like someone decided whenever it was that, well, I've got two arms, which are men and women, because when we work together, we're amazing. But someone decided, I'm just going to use one arm. And so it's like tying one arm, your other arm behind you and saying, I'm never going to use this arm because this other arm is stronger, but based on what? (laughs) Which is completely, like, makes no sense. Um, So I feel like people are realizing, you know what, why? Why can't women save the day? Like, I watch a lot of animation because I love. And it's beautiful to see those stories retold and just new stories being written and women are doing things, yeah. you know? Um, so back to your question, I think people are bored of seeing the same things and people also realise there's nothing threatening about releasing your other arm. <laughs> yeah. It's just life. Why just have one when you can have both? I know this heart. I know it well. How it saves you. And never tells. Mythology is an amazing jumping off point for new work. They are rich, fascinating worlds and characters already there to play with. And as women reclaim their narratives through giving voices and plot lines to pre-existing characters, so do other previously marginalised communities. History is full of trans, non-binary and gender non-conforming myths and stories. And those stories are also being retold, remade and celebrated. Len Blanco is a comedian, singer, actor, drag king, presenter. They make extraordinary work. And they're currently working on a show based on the story of Canis, told through gig theatre. I started by looking at um, the sort of the new writing being done that sort of reclaims uh, female narrative in myth. And I found so many other stories that are starting to be told, lots of non-binary myth and gender fluid gods um and then someone told me about your amazing show which i was really hoping that you would tell me a little bit about how you why you wanted to do it and it's about the myth of canius well this person starts as canis could you tell me the story of the myth abridged obviously as much as possible and um, before you tell me about the show just so we can understand it a bit better absolutely so I'm not the authority, but I have I've, mm-hmm. the, the version of the story I found is Canis 
is a beautiful young Lapith maiden. The Lapiths are distant relatives of the centaurs. They are a kind of woodland, kind of proud, warrior-ish people. And Canis is walking along the seafront one day, and Poseidon's like, like me a bit of that. And uh, they have a a totally non-consensual sexual interaction. Uh, Poseidon is like, that was great, thanks so much. Uh, Feeling super smug and satisfied. And, you know, can I get you anything? Uh, And Canis is like, yeah, you you can turn me into a dude. So that never happens to me again. And Poseidon's like, yeah, 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 sure, 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 no problem. And just as an extra, I'll throw in some impenetrable skin. You want impenetrable skin? And Canis is like, sure. Again, disclaimer, not sure on the the accents or speaking styles of these people, but this is what we're going with stylistically. Sounds right to me. (laughs) And so Canis becomes Canius and becomes this incredibly famous, powerful uh, warrior and is involved tangentially in other myths. Like he has two sons uh, who with him are part of Jason's Argonauts and he's part of the like famous hunt for the boar. He's like a, a footnote hero in like other better known myths. And then one day he is at a Lapith wedding, because remember, he's a Lapith person. We're using he, him pronouns at this point. Pronouns, interesting, debatable. He's at a Lapith wedding, and the centaurs, their distant relatives, are invited, of course. Uh, but the centaurs get start getting really rowdy, they get really drunk, they start carrying off Lapith women from the from the ceremony and so the Lapith men are very angry a fight breaks out and Canius is absolutely foremost in the fray he takes down like five centaurs until one of them clocks him and is like right you and me pal let's go he goes head to head with the lead centaur and does him a mischief and this lead centaur like goes to stab him in the eye but it's not working because obviously, Canius has impenetrable skin. So they're trying their best, but no one is touching Canius. And then this centaur decides that what they need to do, instead of trying to cut him open, is to bury him. So they rip up fir trees on the surrounding hillside, and they lift them up, and they hammer him into the ground. All these centaurs, like hammering him into the ground with tree trunks. So this is where the kind of ending, inverted commas, if there is an ending, of the story diverges into various different possibilities. One is that he's hammered halfway into the ground, so he's like buried from the waist down. Uh, One myth says that he transforms into a bird and flies away. One myth says that he turns into a tree and one ending says not what happens to him at that specific moment, but that later in life, years later, Canis, original female form of this person, is seen wandering the fields of mourning. M-O-U-R-N, mourning. So a pretty... A pretty succinct, easy myth to turn into a stage show then. I'm sorry, I was not short. <laughs> no, I loved it. I really loved it. I just can't imagine how you turned it into a show for consumption. Were there centaurs? Did you fight people? <laughs> um, there is conflict, but it's not physical. The show was originally inspired by uh, a show called Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which is a cult classic queer musical extravaganza about a trans rock star from East Berlin. It weaves in a Greek myth and um, one of the songs is called The Origin of Love and it's about how people used to go around with like four sets of, two sets of arms, two sets of legs, 
back to back and then um the gods became jealous of their connection and severed them and so the idea of the origin of love in hedrick and the angry inch is that we are just looking for our original other half point is rock star greek myth woven in to make sense of the struggles that the protagonist is facing and i was like do you know what i want i want a trans mask equivalent of this epic uh cult story which is kind of gig theater and kind of musical theater uh so it started with that and then i was searching for greek myths that helped me make sense of my own story and canius helps me make sense of my own story because it's about who is defining your gender oh i totally forgot to say the centaur was mock canius during this whole altercation being like oh my god you're that person who's a woman, aren't you? You're that person who's born a woman. La 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 la. And he's like, he gets extra angry. So there's just like a bit of transphobia in there as well. And and Poseidon obviously kind of defines their male form and also gives them impenetrable skin. So it's kind of there's a lot of interesting stuff about who is defining this body and who is making this person and this identity. And um that fits in with the story of the one of the two protagonists in our show. So the show is, there's a band on stage, their lead singer hasn't turned up, they're about to play a really important gig, and they kind of fall apart as a band before the gig happens. And there's the, the, the myth of Canius woven throughout. I mean, the Canius myth is, I mean, amazing and terrible, I guess, in so many ways from your telling it's like okay poseidon gets to define the male body but in a way he he also def- totally defined the female body in in the most like brutal and yet very classic of greek mythology yeah yes i would i would i would say that it's a part of a definition isn't it it's a it's a it's like a claiming of a body or his own purposes and for his own satisfaction and a and a like yeah this is what you are definition by his terms yeah 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 the character that i play is genderqueer and the lead singer of the band is like yeah you're a trans man aren't you and the character that i play is like yeah totally but are they really and what is queer enough and what is trans enough and what is punk enough because they're in this Mm. band and there's a lot of you're not enough as you are going on. And why do you think Greek mythology or mythology in general is an interesting way in to to contemporize these stories? Do you think like it's because all of the stories existed so long ago and, and actually bringing them and making them contemporary is a really interesting way to start a discussion on them? Or is it just a fun story? Well, it is a fun story. It is fun. It's exciting to find out that that story was told so long ago. And there is something inherently validating about the Greek mythological tradition. It is validating because of how our culture set up and because of the impact of the Renaissance and Enlightenment and the Victorians. And and what is considered proper and you know classical education is very very posh. It's looked it's looked upon well culturally. It's got pedigree, whatever. So I think there's part of me as a queer artist and as a queer person that goes, well, if you want some proof that this is valid, that this is not a kind of newfangled idea that people can exist outside of the gender binary, that things are a bit more complicated than that, then please be my guest and look at this revered source, the ancient Greeks. And then also, of course, the truth of that is that, like, there is a story there that has been articulated by a society that that hasn't tried to censor it. There are other genderqueer myths, aren't there, like Tiresias and... Dionysus. Dionysus, exactly. I played Dionysus in a play. It was the best. The, the Greeks weren't like, oh my God. <laughs> I couldn't possibly imagine transcending or transforming through the gender binary. And 
obviously, if you're going to go from one side of the binary to the other side of the binary, there is all this richness in the transformation and in the like question of like, but which one are they? And, you know, are they either? Are they both? Are you trying to ask a question that the gender binary can't actually answer? is one half of Story Jams and a writer and storyteller. She's also the co-creator of The Women Who Gave No Fucks, an amazing blend of cabaret, stand-up and storytelling, all about forgotten stories of women throughout myth, legend and lore. Alice, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, Claire Murphy put us in touch and I'm really excited. I, I loved the sort of fury in a title like The Women Who Gave No Fucks. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about how the show works? So you mentioned Claire Murphy and Claire is instrumental in the early stages of this. So when the hashtag me too thing kind of hit in a big way, uh, a bunch of us started emailing, uh, uh, sort of getting in touch with each other, WhatsApping each other about the stories that we knew and images that we found that were that kind of supported that. We were talking about our experiences and then because we're all storytellers, we started finding instances of like there's a um, a tradition a classical greek tradition of women flashing their bums um not in a kind of woohoo mooning out you know lads mooning mooning out of a coach but it's something quite empowering and these they're these sort of a hidden world of women being empowered that somehow had got a bit lost so we started sort of sharing all these stories and images and claire murphy had already um sort of devised um a format for a live storytelling called a myth-off. A myth-off works like this. You have teams of storytellers and you go up against each other. So you might have a t- and you have rounds, but here's the active listening. This is why it's so brilliant. A, the storytellers have to stick to time and the audience know that because the audience time it. Now, this is some of this is what we developed away from the original myth-off. So, at the moment, you have to tell a story in 10 minutes. So it's super fast. You have to really get to the bones of the story because the audience are going to vote on the woman in the story that most floats their boat, that most fits the title of the round and is the most, for them, you know, really puts pepper on their tail. And they present a prize at the end of each round for the winning woman in the story so we take the emphasis away it's not about judging the storytellers because we never it's really not about that it's about listening to the stories and really actively listening to those and um it's very silly because there's a lot of audience participation it's great and we we always have guests so we hear lots of different voices lots of different perspectives uh we had a non-binary lovely storyteller called amelia armand with us last night they they told us a great story that was just you could tell the audience were just on fire with it um at the interval as long as we're somewhere with a sort of floor stage floor where uh you can write on it in chalk which often is the case we invite the audience up onto the stage and we invite them to write on the floor the names of the women who most float their boat most inspire them they think everyone should know about by the time we've left the stage they're storming the stage and we come back after the interval and the floor is covered big writing they don't write little writing covered in the names of all these wonderful women we've heard of women we haven't heard of people's aunties frida carlo everyone and we spend the second half of the show literally walking about on the names of these amazing amazing women it is utterly beautiful and where do the stories come from do you or does somebody research forgotten female stories from different time periods or mythological systems we always have guests so we have a couple of uh, zoom meetings with people in advance after we've invited them and they've accepted uh, coming on board with us, which is lovely, and we get to work with lots of new people. And but we say so mythological or historical, so so it can be a total mixture of voice, style of telling, presentation, and also the types of stories we get is really really mixed. Do you have a favourite story you've heard recently during the show? 
Oh, so on the spot, Lucy Lill, who is my partner at Story Jam with the producers, and we always perform in it. She tells a story, she told it last night. Um, she tells a story about Hervor, who is a kind of shield maiden, would have been called a, a tomboy sort of 30 years ago. So she's kind of Scandinavian, and she is the inheritor of a sword and everyone says it's not a sword for a girl whenever it's drawn it will not go back in its scabbard until it's ta- it's drawn blood she's a great fighter and her mum's really disappointed in her her dad wants her to behave like a girl they just want her to settle down she doesn't want to do that she eventually goes off and gets this this sword is buried with her father and she basically raises her father from the dead claims the sword and even her dead father says it's not a sword for a lady and um, if you hand this down to your sons assuming she's going to have sons it's a terrible curse and she says and i find this absolutely radical and lucy is a mother so she says what my children choose to do with their birthright is none of my business it's mine and i will take what's mine and that's so radical so radical going what my children do when they're adults is not my total responsibility the choices they make it's astonishing quietly astonishing how much did mythology and the portrayal of women in mythology inspire the inception of this project inspire or affect the inception of this project this particular project comes from yeah, just wanting to tell these stories, these stories that don't get told enough. I tell one about uh, the belly laugh goddess who is so great and so, you know, laughter in the middle of the worst, darkest times and how that's empowering and how women's, you know, women helping other women to laugh and then how much strength and nourishment that can give you, for example. So that it, that's the kind of angle that seems really juicy. But I guess because we work with myth a fair amount, Lucy and I work quite a lot with myth. Um, we're quite steeped in it. It feeds in that way. So this particular project comes from, no, we want to tell women uh, women's stories that have been told and now have somehow over the centuries have been dropped or channeled in a particular way and that's not the only way that, as you were saying right at the beginning, it's not the only way they can be told, it isn't just from a male perspective. And because there are awful things that happen in these stories where, you know, women get raped all the time and there are no consequences. And it's almost just sort of happens in the course of the story, just as a sort of inciting incident or whatever. And, and they haven't been unpacked properly and understood why, why is that image or does it have to have that image or it's so lightly held when it should be held so carefully and meaningfully yeah awful devaluing of women's experience of being in an audience as well and sort of realizing that the moment I realized that women sitting in an audience do not hear the same story as the men in the audience let alone every individual brings their own stuff Mm. to a story that they're hearing or any performance whether it's music or theatre or spoken word or um, storytelling or whatever but that you know men in the audience will hear uh, power when we hear disempowerment and they will hear threat when we hear opportunity or you know and that there's a kind of mutual understanding that we can bring by telling these stories in a different way and they're empowering for men as well men need to hear about how women really experience the world and what a lack for men not to have female role models it's all about perspective and toxic masculinity is still alive and well it's so hard to shift perspective and to to try and make people see that women reclaiming their stories doesn't take anything away from anybody else. It's very hard for them to understand that budging up and not seeing themselves as the kind of the plumb line Mm. from which everything else deviates. That's a terrible burden as well as, you know, a privilege that isn't useful. Exactly. It's not getting out the way. It's just moving up. I feel like artistic trends... Uh, gather force and clarity over time. And what we're seeing um, is not just this huge surge in retelling of Western mythology, in in particular the Medusa and Medea myths are being have gotten a lot of attention and being rewritten fabulously, but also East African myth, Korean, Indian goddesses and legends, all stories that are being told and popularized in novels and plays. Do you have a sense about 
why that sort of dam has burst. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much. It's a moment, isn't it? Well, hopefully it's more than a moment. It's a rebalancing, isn't it? And once the conversation starts, and because we've got social media, so we talk across the continents, um, and uh, so much is certainly for people who are online and uh, use social media, there's such a kind of bursting open of opportunities just to even if you're on the dreaded twitter and you just my twitter feed's actually very lovely a lot of the time <laughs> and i see people from all around the world and the stories that they're telling or they're kind of sharing images and so on and we just get that kind of cross fertilization and it's just been supercharged and i think we're so hungry women have been so hungry for it and we've got a way of doing that in a way which doesn't have to go through official channels you don't have to book a venue and tell people that way you can get it out in a you know in a few words you can start talking about it and the conversation spreads and spreads and spreads and it's like it's like fuel on the fire isn't it it'll just grow and grow and grow wouldn't it be great if we got beyond it so it just kind of became embedded and we moved on to and then whatever glor- hopefully glorious thing comes next i love the optimism <laughs> i'm here for the optimism and you bring all of these different storytellers to your shows you must be reaching so many people that way and telling so many stories that so many of the other storytellers wouldn't have heard of. Uh, do you have a myth that you yourself like to tell when you do the show? There are a couple of stories I go back and back and back to. One of them is Balbo, the belly laugh goddess. I just find that incredibly powerful and necessary and it seems to touch people. But there's another story which is uh, a particular Baba Yaga story. Like lots of folk and fairy stories there are things that will there are tropes things that will be very familiar so there's a little girl and her mother dies and she's got a stepmother normal everything in this is normal she gets sent to baba yaga who's the witch in the forest because her stepmother is trying to get her killed essentially they're fed up with her and a whole bunch of stuff happens there are burning skulls there's attempts to kill her in various ways by working her to death and oh it's just quite grim her life is awful this poor little girl as her mother is dying she reaches under the bedclothes and she pulls out a doll, little doll, and she gives it to her daughter, Vasilisa, and she says, put her in your pocket. This is my blessing to you. This is my gift to you. Don't tell her anyone about her. Just put her in your pocket. And when you're in trouble, give her something to eat, give her something to drink, and she'll help you. Vasilisa does what her mum says. And she ends up in Baba Yaga's hut. Baba Yaga is a witch who rides around in a mortar and pestle, She's brilliant and terrible. Um, Some people see her as a pure witch. I think she's more than that. She's wise, she's useful, but she's terrifying. She's got iron teeth. She will eat you. Uh, She's got a nose and chin that join. She slings her tits over the rafters when she gets home. She's, you know, she's uh, grotesque. She's great. She's gloriously (laughs) appalling and terrifying. She sets these impossible tasks for Vasilisa. And she says, if you can't fulfill them while I'm out, I will eat you. And Vasilisa's in despair. She has to sort see different sorts of seeds out. She has to sort good grain from mouldy grain. She has to do all this work. It's impossible. And as soon as Baba Yaga has gone to sleep, uh, Vasilisa gets her doll out of her pocket and she gives her a little bit of something to eat, a little bit of something to drink, and says, I've got this problem. And the doll says, eat a little, sleep a little. The morning is wiser than the evening. And Vasilisa goes to sleep and always when she wakes up, the work is more or less done. All she has to do is make food and make Baba Yaga's dinner and the rest is done. The impossible task is finished. So everything turns out okay for Vasilisa. But that image of the doll in the pocket and the the instinct, listen to your instinct and sleep on it and the problem will move or shift it won't be entirely done for you you'll have to do some stuff but it will shift rest nourish yourself but that thing that image of the instinct the doll in the pocket that you don't show anyone but is yours and you're aware of and the doll will jump up and down in her pocket when she's in danger and kind of pinch her (laughs) when she's about to do or say the wrong thing and I love that story so much and it's so important for women to listen to nurture and nourish our instincts because our instincts will save us. Keep your instinct alive. Don't repress it. Don't ignore what your deep self tells you is right or healthy for you or useful or will keep you alive. Don't ignore it. Don't get eaten. What 
what a way to end. I want to thank all my speakers today. Josephine Burton, Lola May, Len Blanco and Alice Torrance. If you like the Dash Arts podcast, please rate and review us. It would mean the world. As I mentioned to Josephine, Priscilla Grace has recorded a little exclusive for me of one of my favourite songs in the show. And that's going to play us out. We'll be back next month. I'm Rachel Head. Thank you for listening. When we can all have a bit and then we can fuck. Fuck in the morning. Morning. Fuck later night. And the day in unity and love at first sight. And the day in unity and love.